The next item of business is a debate on motion 3761 in the name of Angela Constance on the prevention and eradication of female genital mutilation and all other forms of so-called honour-based violence. Can I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion up to 12 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you, President Officer. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I'm pleased to open the debate on this very important matter. Today, ahead of International Day for Zero Tolerance to FGM, which is Monday the 6th of February, we collectively have the opportunity to add our voices to those around the world opposing uh, female genital mutilation. This global day, which has been marked by our Parliament for a number of years, provides people uh, all over the world with an opportunity to take a stand against a practice that has absolutely no place in society, yet unfortunately still affects far too many communities uh, across the globe. Female genital mutilation, as with any form of so-called honour-based violence, is a specific form of gender-based violence and an abuse of human rights. World Health Organisation figures tell us that 200 million uh, women and girls globally are affected by FGM and this is systematic uh, of the inequality that women and girls all over the world experience uh, because of their gender. Our strategy, Equally Safe, recognises that so-called honour-based violence, regardless of what form it may take, and like all forms of gender-based violence, is pure and simply about power and control. It embeds this understanding in the law of the land and gives the police and our prosecutors the powers to tackle it. Practices such as FGM and forced marriage are manifestations of that imbalance of power. And I am glad that the UK Government has recognised this by finally supporting at the end uh, of last year the Private Members Bill uh, brought forward by Dr Ailey Whiteford MP uh, calling for the UK Government to ratify uh, the Istanbul Convention. An issue uh, I support and highlighted in this chamber at the end of last year uh, when we all marked the 16 days of activism uh, against violence against women and girls. And although the UK Government signed the Convention nearly five years ago, as we all know, it has yet to be uh, ratified. And the Convention states the need to fully address violence against women in all its forums and to take measures to prevent it, protect its victims uh, and prosecute perpetrators. And I hope that by supporting Dr Whiteford's bill, uh, the UK Government are signalling now momentum for ratification of the Istanbul Convention and that they will work with the Scottish Government and indeed others uh, to overcome uh, the last few obstacles and not yet again kick this important issue uh, into the long uh, grass. And as the bill uh, now enters its committee stage, I hope the UK Government really do uh, seize the opportunity to take forward uh, this important uh, issue. I do, however, uh, compliment the UK Government on the good work they have done with respect to FGM, and I am pleased to say that we will be supporting uh, the amendment in the name of Annie Wells. Tackling FGM and indeed uh, all other forms of violence against women under the guise of culture or religion, so-called honour-based violence, requires a response that extends protections to those at risk and which holds those who choose to perpetuate this abuse to account. And not that long ago, few people had even heard of female genital mutilation eh, or forced marriage. Mm -hmm. Now we have legislation to protect people from honour-based violence and a national action plan to prevent and eradicate eh, female genital mutilation. The plan, presiding officers, which runs until 2020, sets out an agreed range of actions and associated activities to be taken forward eh, by the Scottish Government and its partners in communities, the third sector and the public sector eh, to prevent and ultimately eradicate FGA. Actions from the plan are being taken forward uh, under the guidance of a multi-agency national implementation group who will monitor progress over its lifespan and give a sharp focus uh, to the practical approach uh, we can take to, to realise our ambitions on this agenda. 
There are no quick fixes to tackling FGM and honour-based violence. It is a complex and often hidden issue, and there is no single solution to ending it. And with that in mind, our approach to preventing and eradicating these practices it has been informed by collaboration. Collaboration with faith leaders and community activists who are uniquely placed to be at the very heart of work to effect significant social, cultural and attitudinal change. And as such, I'm very pleased to support uh, the amendment tabled by uh, Mary Fee today also. It's also crucial that we collaborate with organisations and agencies across the statutory and third sector who are working to help us uh, understand uh, the background to these practices. For example, we have recently published research on understanding forced marriage in Scotland. This research, commissioned uh, by the Scottish Government, outlines uh, nine recommendations and forms part of our ongoing work in bringing together key agencies uh, to protect those uh, affected by forced marriage. And I want to put on record my thanks to the, the authors of this in-depth, insightful and very <coughs> useful research. What's clear is that survivors identify the excellent support they receive from third sector agencies who are providing first class trusted support. And the research has also very helpfully identified the barriers to accessing and receiving the right support and intervention at the right time. And so we must seek to increase the confidence of those who need assistance and also the confidence and capacity of those who need to provide assistance. And we will be working in partnership uh, with the multi-agency forced marriage network, uh, which is facilitated by the Scottish Government, to look at how we take forward uh, the recommendations from this research. It is this type of collaboration that can support our aims, whether it's within forced marriage, FGM, or with the, the wider eradication of violence against women. As part of a week of activity to mark the International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation, I am proud to be attending the Kenyan Women in Scotland Association's National Conference here in Edinburgh on Saturday, and I'll also be meeting with Waverley Care uh, next week. Both of these organisations are respected for their work in tackling FGM and are key partners in their work to eradicate it. It is this joined up approach that will help to ensure that what we do, not only to protect those at risk from harm, but what we do to try and end this practice is informed by cooperation, conversation, and a collective will to bring about change. Signing officer, I would like to turn briefly to legislation. No doubt many of you in this chamber will be aware that FGM has been unlawful in Scotland for over 30 years with the Prohibition of Female Circumcision Act uh, 1985. The Female Genital Mutilation Scotland Act 2005 then re-enacted the 85 Act and extended protection by making a criminal offence to have FGM carried out either in Scotland or abroad by giving those offences uh, extra territorial powers. The Scottish Government worked very collaboratively with the UK Government to close a loophole in the Prohibition of FGM Act 2005 to extend the reach of the extraterritorial offences in that Act to habitual as well as permanent UK residents. And this was achieved by means of a legislative consent motion uh, in the Serious Crime Act uh, 2015. The Serious Crime Act also contains a number of provisions uh, relating to FGM and have come into force in England and Wales. We have looked very closely at each of them and have taken a thoughtful and considerate approach uh, to the best way forward for Scotland. To ensure that what we choose to do is informed by the best information we have, the Scottish Government consulted across the statutory and third sectors mm -hmm. and with a cross-section of potentially uh, affected communities uh, to gather their views uh, on those provisions. And we're now considering the feedback from this engagement uh, and we now look to how we will take this forward in Scotland. I would also like to briefly address the issue of prosecutions. Much continues to be made of the fact, understandably, 
that whilst FGM has been illegal for over 30 years, there has not been a single prosecution in Scotland eh, nor in any other part of the UK. FGM, by its very nature, is a hidden issue, one which may be underreported, an issue where those affected may not be able to come forward or indeed eh, share their concerns. And that is why our work with communities is so important in giving people both the understanding and the confidence to discuss, challenge uh, and report the practice. At the launch of Scotland's National Action Plan on 4th February 2016, speakers from the statutory sector and from potentially affected communities all made the point that the law needs to protect those at risk and ensure those who perpetuate this abuse are held to account. However, they were equally clear that prosecution should be part of an overall response, which includes protection for those at risk and the provision of services uh, for those affected. Nevertheless, President Officer, let me be clear, while there have been no prosecutions in Scotland, every referral or child welfare concern made to the police relating to concerns that girls were at risk of having FGM performed on them have been fully investigated by Police Scotland and no criminality has been found. But of course, we have to remain ever vigilant. In closing, President Officer, I would like to reiterate this mm -hmm. government's commitment to preventing and eradicating FGM, so-called honour-based violence, and all other forms eh, of violence against women and girls. And our approach has been and continues to be one of working closely eh, with all our partners, eh, to which I would like to pay tribute to here today. It is the commitment of professionals across the third and statutory sector who protect those at risk and who respond to the damage that FGM causes that enables many women and girls to live their lives free from harm or to rebuild their lives eh, when harm is identified. It is also the commitment of the many unrecognised individuals working within affected communities who give so freely of their time and talents eh, to raise awareness and who challenge the practice. Presiding officer, the desire, drive and determination to rid our society of forms of violence against women and girls in whatever forum they may take must unite uh, this parliament and together with our stakeholders uh, we can all help to end it. Uh, thank you very much and I move uh, the motion in my name. I now call Annie Wells to speak to and move Amendment 3761.1. Ms Wells, up to eight minutes please. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. There can be no justification for female genital mutilation or FGM, and I welcome the Scottish Government's efforts at home as well as the UK Government's effort, uh, efforts abroad to tackle this awful crime. I also want to take the opportunity, as the Cabinet Secretary does, did, to raise awareness today of International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM next Monday. FGM, which involves the full or partial removal of young girls' genitals, has no health benefits and although carried out for a number of reasons, in many cases, it is done solely to improve a daughter's marriage prospects. It stems from a deep-rooted inequality between the sexes and can only be seen as a violation of the rights of women and girls, no matter their cultural background. The ramifications can be massive, both physically and psychologically, often commonly performed by people with no medical training and without proper consideration for hygiene. Complications can include severe bleeding, problems urinating, cysts, infections and infertility, as well as complications in childbirth and an increased risk of newborn deaths. In 2015, a survivor of the crime now living in Glasgow spoke bravely about her experience to a local newspaper in order to raise awareness of FGM. Forced to undergo the procedure at the age of just four in her home country, Gambia, she spoke of being locked in a house with 50 to 60 girls as young as three months. She described the ordeal as destroying her life, affecting her mental health, her desire to form a relationship with a man, as well as the infections she regularly picked up. Worldwide, UNICEF estimates that at least 200 million girls and women have been subjected to the practice of FGM across 30 countries, and I am pleased that the UK has been a key player internationally in trying to tackle it. 
The Department for International Development has allocated £184 million to a number of programmes tackling gender violence issues such as FGM, forced marriages and female infanticide. It has allocated £35 million specifically to reduce FGM by 30% in 17 countries across Africa. As well as we all know, however, this practice also takes place behind closed doors at homes across the UK. In the UK, government figures estimate that 170,000 women and girls have undergone this procedure. In Scotland, it is understood that nearly 3,000 girls were born to mothers born in FGM practising countries. I commend the work that the Scottish Government has done on this issue. The 2005 FGM Act, which updated Scottish legislation, increased the maximum penalty for the crime to 14 years. It also made it illegal for family members to take girls abroad to carry out this practice. Last year's Scotland's National Approach Plan to prevent and eradicate FGM went a long way in informing the preventative educational measures needed to raise awareness of FGM. Letters and presentations raised awareness amongst teachers and healthcare professionals and Police Scotland produced internal guidance for officers dealing with honour-based violence. That these were among the measures. The Scottish Government also, of course, allocates money to a number of programmes and organisations relating to improved women's rights as part of its Violence Against Women and Girls budget. I will, of course, always support a consensual approach to issues such as FGM and other forms of honour-based violence. It's important that we get, it right, get this right for every girl at risk in Scotland and that we work together to build on the efforts and initiatives of the past. It would be wrong of me, however, not to raise some of the points I see as important, issues, as important to this issue, to look at what's happening down south and at least bring to the debate the initiatives taking place in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's um, input regarding the report that the Scottish Government received and that they'll be looking into that. And that is the mandatory reporting of FGM cases in females 18 and under by doctors, nurses and education professionals as well as FGM protection orders. In December 2014, the Scottish Refugee Council published its report on tackling FGM in Scotland, a report commissioned by the, the Scottish Government, which, uh, which I made reference to earlier, that the Cabinet Secretary is going to uh, review. And among its suggestions were the reporting of FGM cases with statutory bodies, as well as the need to send out a strong criminal justice message. Court protection orders, as we see in the rest of the UK, mean that potential victims can be protected, from, for example, by the mandatory surrendering of a passport so that families are not able to travel abroad. The UK government has been actively encouraging all agencies, including local authorities, social work, police forces and schools, to make use of them. The mandatory reporting of incidents of FGM for females 18 and under by healthcare professionals and teachers has meant that the statistics are now more reliable when it comes to estimating the number of those affected. Issues of underreporting, of course, exist, which is why measures like anonymity for victims at risk of being identified are so important. Collectively, I think it's important that we all question the lack of successful FGM-related prosecutions, both in Scotland and the rest of the UK that have taken place since becoming illegal in 1985, and we know there's been none in fact. However, I, I welcome that all reports of the crime are being fully investigated by Police Scotland, as, as rightly so. Comments have been made in the past over families traveling, traveling to the UK to have the procedure done due to a perceived leniency. There is room for us to be tougher on this awful crime. I would like to end today by noting just some of the efforts made locally in Glasgow to tackle FGM and other forms of honour-based violence. Rape Crisis Glasgow's Ruby Project, for example, supports victims of sexual violence, including those who have suffered FGM. I would also like to thank the Scottish Government for bringing this vitally important issue to the Chamber today and for the renewed focus on tackling FGM. We must work together to build on efforts of the past to prevent this abuse from occurring in the first place, to support those who fall victim to honour-based violence and to ensure robust criminal sanctions are in place for those who commit the abuse. 
I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Mary Fee to speak to and move Amendment 3761.2. Ms Fee, up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking the Equalities Minister for her motion today, highlighting the important work to tackle and end female genital mutilation and so-called honour-based violence and bringing it to the Chamber to allow us to debate it. And speaking on behalf of Scottish Labour, I am happy to confirm that we will support both the Government's uh, motion and the Conservative amendment today. And I would ask um, for support for our amendment, um, one which may be small in detail, yet is hugely significant to meet our shared ambitions. And, presiding officer, it is with regret and sadness that we require this debate and that we need to have an international day of zero tolerance for female genital mutilation. Regret and sadness knowing that medieval, barbaric and horrific acts of violence and mutilation are still carried out in the 21st century, primarily against young women and children. There will be few countries, if any, in the world that won't be affected in some way by female genital mutilation or honour-based violence. So it's right that as a parliament we help in the global fight to shine a light on these behaviours and to raise awareness of the dangers of the violence and the cruelty in the hope of eradicating FGM and honour-based violence. And I'm sure across the chamber there would have been anger when reading The Economist article An Agonising Choice from June last year, which called for a new approach, one which supports minor forms of FGM. And the author tried to argue that allowing minor forms that cause no long-lasting harm is better than being butchered in a back room by a village elder. Accepting this proposal would be a backward step and send the wrong message that abuse and mutilation of a child through FGM is somehow acceptable. And campaign groups across the UK were right to quickly condemn this article. And unfortunately, The Guardian went on to then report that it gave ammunition to supporters and practitioners of FGM that some in the West are on their side. And Scottish Labour and I am sure members from across this chamber will never give these ideas the time of day. And instead, we will continue to stand on the side of the women, the girls and the families who are affected by FGM to bring an end to this barbarity. The World Health Organisation estimates that over 125 million women and girls are affected by FGM. Incidences of FGM tend to be concentrated in pockets of the Middle East, across Central Africa and increasingly in South Asia. Inspiration in tackling FGM can be taken from the work of NGOs and communities across the world. The work of Safe Kenya is an illuminating example of this. Female genital mutilation is illegal in Kenya, but is still widely practised in rural areas across the country as a rite of passage. Safe Kenya has taken a community-based approach to tackling this gender-based violence, with three projects which are aimed at changing the cultural practices that normalise FGM. In the Luisa Hills in Kenya, before Safe Kenya started working in the region, the rate of FGM was 98%. And by promoting an alternative rite of passage, this rate has now dropped by 20%. The practice of FGM and honour-based violence is driven by the deep-rooted, unequal power relationship between men and women across the globe. And education is key to tackling FGM and honour-based violence. A grassroots approach aimed at altering cultural views on FGM may be a slow process, but it is a necessary one and an effective means in the fight to eradicate FGM across the globe. And it's important to educate young boys and men. The FGM is an extremely dangerous procedure, which is not a religious requirement. It is not a prerequisite for marriage and it is not a rite of passage ritual. It is quite simply an unnecessary, barbaric act which violates women and girls' human rights. And it's estimated that 24,000 people living in Scotland were born in an FGM practising countries and that 12 women in the UK each year lose their lives to honour killings. 
all women and girls in communities the length and breadth of Scotland must feel safe, respected and equal. And it is the duty of this Parliament to make that ambition a priority. And whilst we must continue to support the victims of FGM in Scotland, we must also contribute to the global campaign to eradicate the practice of FGM. The UN International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation is a prime opportunity for the global community to use the power of their collective voice and show their strength in condemning the barbaric act of FGM. And in closing, Presiding Officer, I repeat our support for both the Government motion and the Conservative amendment and ask that we recognise the role that faith leaders, well respected by their communities, can play in eradicating FGM and honour-based violence. And the Scottish Government Action Plan is an important as aspect of their commitment to end FGM in a generation. And I am happy to work with the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister taking that plan forward. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. We now move to the open contributions. Can I remind members who wish to speak to make sure that they have pressed their buttons? I'm trying hard not to stare at the people who haven't. <laughs> and uh, I have a wee bit time in hand to allow for interventions. And I call on Ruth McGuire to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in such an important debate as we look ahead to the 6th of February as the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. FGM is a reprehensible and completely unacceptable illegal practice that no child should have to suffer. But if it's easy to condemn, it's less easy to eradicate. As has been mentioned, according to UNICEF, at least 200 million girls have been subjected to the practice of FGM across 30 countries, but the exact numbers remain unknown. It's found in 28 African countries and also in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. It's also found in Europe and elsewhere amongst communities originating from these parts of the world. Here, FGM is seen in some ethnic groups that have migrated to this country. As the Cabinet Secretary said in opening, FGM is a complex, sensitive and often hidden issue to which there's no easy fix. It's rooted in what are, to many of us, alien and quite appalling traditions. And when it comes to engaging with FGM practising communities, there are often language as well as cultural barriers to contend with. Working towards its prevention and eradication thus demands working sensitively and with many different sectors. It also means working with and within the communities directly affected, as the only way to truly eradicate FGM is to eradicate the damaging attitudes and cultural traditions that underpin it. I strongly welcome the National Action Plan published last year and its recognition of the scale of the challenges involved, as well as its realistic and robust objectives and its commitment to working with partners across the statutory and third sectors, from Police Scotland to Scottish Women's Aid. I also welcome the commitment to work with those directly involved, because it's in the communities itself that the problem exists and where it must ultimately be solved. If FGM is to be eradicated in Scotland, long-term social, cultural and attitudinal change must be our goal. For however wrong and appalling we find it, as long as FGM is accepted, is considered to be important or necessary to some communities, it will be an issue. The National Action Plan to tackle FGM is inextricable from the wider Equally Safe strategy for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. This is because FGM at its most fundamental is an extreme form of violence against girls and women and is rooted in gender inequality and discrimination. It's the extreme end of a vast and varied spectrum of the objectification of girls and women, which ultimately results in abuse of their bodies. Whilst the horrors of FGM may be an alien practice to many of us here, it would be foolish to think that this is a problem for others. We're not immune from the discrimination against and objectification of women and girls in our culture, which are rooted just in the same gender inequality and damaging attitudes and cultural norms here. Far from it, it's endemic. And it manifests itself daily in our newspapers, on the television, on the street, in the playground, 
and even presiding officer, as we saw recently in chambers of parliament sometimes. It's everywhere and on a scale that can feel pretty overwhelming. Similarly, though the starting point is more extreme, the fundamental aims and objectives of the action plan to tackle FGM are the same of, as those of the Equally Safe Strategy, a Scotland where women and girls live free from abuse and the attitudes that help perpetrate it, and where women and girls feel safe, respected and equal, where women are empowered and enjoy equality of opportunity, particularly with regard to resources, where positive gender roles are promoted and where people understand what healthy and positive relationships are. For this reason, we all have a role to play in tackling FGM, as we can and must all play our part in tackling the wider inequality which underpins it. Providing good services for victims and survivors is crucial, but we also have to start recognising the context in which this violence is taking place. A culture where everyday sexism and the objectification of women is the norm is conducive to violence and must be challenged if we are to make a lasting difference to the lives of women and girls. And we can start making that difference here, presiding officer, by all agreeing to not tolerate any objectification of women in our own or in any other culture. Thank you. I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Claire Hawkey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. But we have no slaves in Scotland and mothers cannot sell their bairns. So decided the Court of Session in Edinburgh almost exactly 330 years ago on the 13th of January 1687 in the case of Reed against Scott of Harden and his lady. For those interested in uh, references for quotes, that is found in the case report in Morrison's Dictionary at 14545. The case was about a lassie who was used by a travelling showman as a performing gymnast until she fled and was given refuge by a couple. He raised an action in the court claiming that he had bought the girl from her mother and she must be returned. The court refused to countenance that argument. Now, what relevance is something from hundreds of years ago today? Sadly, this and other problems such as the one we're talking about are still with us. A few days ago, I attended the Tumbling Lassie seminar hosted by the Faculty of Advocates, uh, which had a number of eminent speakers, including Alison Di Rollo, Solicitor General for Scotland. The seminar was held to raise awareness of modern day slavery and human trafficking, which sadly some think is entirely behind us. Now, that issue is a real one, as we know from recent police investigations in Scotland. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance and the price of freedom, the con constant review of the current state of affairs. Otherwise, we might have no need for politicians. The practice of female genital mutilation, as has already been said, has been illegal in Scotland since 1985, but we still know little about the numbers of people here who have been affected by it or who may be at risk. Such crimes, as well as other so-called honor-based violence, are often culturally based, devoid of any religious basis, and shut off from mainstream society. It has been reported this week that Scottish government research shows that 191 girls and women were forced into marriages in Scotland between 2011 and 2014, 10% of whom were between 14 and 16, another issue that is sadly still with us today. And as has already been said, because of the underground nature of these crimes, research into that is difficult. But it is imperative that we know more about this. Scotland's National Action Plan to tackle FGM recognises the lack of available data on which communities in Scotland might be likely to be directly affected by this issue. The first annual statistical information was published for England in July 2016. Uh, corresponding data for Scotland is needed to understand what allocation of resources 
need to be put into dealing with the issue and stopping it here. So I, have, I do have a question, which is, will the Scottish Government be following the actions of the UK Government in that regard? And I simply pose that as a question in the context of this debate. It may be a more important issue going forward in Scotland than we have been aware of, given changes in ethnic diversity over the last decade. We need to know more about the potential for FGM and other so-called honour-based violence acts taking place here in Scotland, what we can do to prevent it, and how we can seek to help the victims and deal with the consequences. The amendment by my colleague Annie Wells recognises the work the UK Government has been undertaking internationally to reduce the occurrence of FGM, allocating £35 million, as has been commented on, to action to tackle this on the African continent. Note should also be taken of the legislation in England and Wales in the Serious Crime Act 2015, which may be relevant to inform the Scottish situation. For example, the mandatory duty for professionals to report cases of FGM to the police if they believe it has occurred, for which they are given statutory guidance to assist them. So a further question, which is, will the Scottish Government consider taking similar steps? Does it have plans to do so in the future? And what will be the time scale uh, on which we hear about such action being taken? These are horrendous crimes that inflict physical and psychological pain on victims, and perpetrators need to know that it is unacceptable in Scotland, the wider UK, and indeed around the world. So on this basis, I am happy to support the motion and also the amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lindhurst. I call Claire Hockey to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Ms Hockey, please. Officer. FGM is a sanitised term that allows us to talk about female genital mutilation without dealing with each of these three words. Mutilation of young women leaves scars, both physical and mental, and that lasts a lifetime for victims and also for the communities that practice it. Let's be clear, FGM involves performing quote-unquote surgery on the genitals of young women and girls. These procedures can involve cutting off parts of the labia and clitoris, or otherwise sewing and stitching up the vulva or vaginal opening. These procedures offer zero medical benefits. All they guarantee is pain and suffering. But these procedures are performed by families who believe that FGM must be carried out. They believe that it's the right thing to do. And they believe that FGM is the key to maintaining respectability and standing in their community. And often for the young girls themselves, they see it as a rite of passage from childhood to becoming a woman. In reality, however, FGM is used to ensure a woman is culturally acceptable, upholding family honour and tradition, and ensures that she's seen as suitable for her permitted role as a wife. By damaging her genitals, a community can damage her ability to have sexual relationships and can ensure that sex, instead of being a natural part of human expression, is painful and unpalatable for her. It is, at its essence, a way of controlling a woman's sexual behaviour. The young women who experience this violence suffer in painful and perhaps more obvious physical ways. Difficulty in urinating, sexual problems, problems in childbirth and wounds that become infected and can lead to further complications. But what about other wounds that are inflicted? Post-traumatic stress disorder among survivors of FGM are at the same levels as those who have been subject to childhood abuse. And research has shown that anger, pain and sadness continue through later life for these women and that ongoing chronic stress, anxiety disorders and sleep problems are common in survivors. A number of studies have touched on the impact to the survivor, but I also want to consider the impact being part of this abuse has on the community as a whole. How many mothers who themselves have experienced FGM come to decide on FGM for their own daughters? Violence affects not only the victims, but the perpetrators too. Frequently, those who arrange or are complicit in inflicting FGM on children experienced FGM themselves. It begets a cycle of abuse, 
where mutilation is the norm and the pain and suffering that is caused is less important than being seen to fit in. FGM as a way of policing of women's bodies is a double crime. It is inflicted on young women and then those young women themselves go on to become party to in inflicting it on the next generation. But how many of these are true choices, free of coercion and influence from their wider group? When we tackle FGM, as we should, we should also remember the full cost that we are asking young women to pay when they share what has happened to them. We're asking them not only to admit what has been done to them, to discuss their bodies with strangers and people outside their community, but we're also asking them to admit that their community, their family, has been party to it. When we acknowledge a crime, by extension, those who have committed it are criminals. For young women who have experienced FGM, it contributes to the huge burden of emotional and psychological damage that they already carry from the abuse. Presiding officer, although these crimes are carried out to ensure honour, there is nothing honourable in violence and abuse. Under-reporting of FGM is strongly suspected, and this ties with other forms of abuse where fear and issues of love Loyalty, propriety are entwined to create an emotional net that prevents women from speaking out about what has been done to them. We need to empower women to talk openly about these threats and experiences, especially those who are at risk, or those in communities who we know have girls who are at risk of FGM. This is especially true given the studies that studies have shown that women who have experienced FGM tend to develop psychological conditions which make them withdrawn, uncommunicative or distrustful. The women whose voices we need to hear the most are those who are most likely to be silenced by their experience. Committing FGM is a crime, and I'm proud the Scottish Government has been forthright in condemning it, and I'm heartened to hear so many around this chamber today do so too. We need to consent female genital mutilation to history, and we will do this by, by ensuring the crime is policed, but also through joined up thinking around public services and support for the women affected. The Scottish Refugee Council has identified that 24,000 people born in an FGM practicing country are living in, in Scotland, with nearly 9,000 of these in Glasgow. Any small community of this size will need support to adjust to life here in this country that has been more, more developed and has proactive public services. We must reach out and engage with all communities, but especially so where there's the potential for FGM. We must communicate to women, young and old, that genital mutilation is wrong and that whatever the practices of the past, it's not acceptable in Scotland. We must also seek to amplify the voices of women in those communities who are already standing up against FGM and empower young women to support each other in their communities. Presiding officer, I welcome that projects such as the Kenyan Women in Scotland Association and Rape Crisis Glasgow's FGM Survivor Support Service are benefiting from funding from the Scottish Government to drive the equality agenda in 2016-17. And I welcome all steps this government takes to tackle all forms of violence that seek to control women's bodies and police women's behaviour under the corrosive banner of honour. Thank you, Ms. Hockey. I call Pauline McNeill to be followed by John Finney. Ms McNeill, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Child marriage and honour killings are just two elements of the wider systematic subjugation, exploitation and domination of women and girls around the world. And as we've heard, Scotland is not free of it. Previous Labour governments have legislated on it and the Scottish Government is to be commended for leading on it today. Womankind will not be free until we have made more significant progress towards protecting women and girls from the horrors of FGM forced marriage, very often forced into marriage when they are children, and the so-called honour-based violence, which is murder and violence, just the same. Child marriage is often physically violent and in many cases is tantamount to rape. Jaswinder Sangera, who's founder of the charity Carmen Irvana, said, Emotional blackmail is huge in these cases. Either you're going to be raped on your wedding night or you're going to be disowned by your family. Lots of young people are faced with that horrible choice. That charity receives 850 calls a month, mostly from victims. So we know that children are forced into marriages 
and having children when they themselves are as young as 13 or 14 and have hardly had time to um, become adults themselves. But as we've heard from others, the so-called honour-based killing, just to go through what it's meant, what's meant by it, it is said it's an unwritten code known as honour. Girls are raised to believe that their purpose in life is to uphold the honour of the family. And if they bring so-called dishonour, then they pay the price of that with their own lives. Many, many women have come to the UK from other countries to escape that violence, and some have not. Honour killing takes place in order to erase the dishonour. The majority of honour killings are girls and women, but men can be victims too. Usually the perpetrators are men, but importantly, family members can be actively and passively involved in these killings. And the majority of reported killings have been carried out by family members. So that is what is meant by honour-based killing. 29 cases uh, in the UK so far between 2010 and 2014 have been recorded. And the UK police reported over 28,000 cases of honour-based violence, including abduction, mutilation, acid attacks, beatings and murder. As Gordon Lynnhurst pointed out, there's 191 cases of forced marriage in Scotland just over the last four years, but we do need more data on that. But just to focus for a minute on the international picture, one in three girls in the developing world are said to be married before they reach the age of 18. A staggering 700 million women alive today were married as children. If there is no reduction in child marriage, the global number of child brides will reach 1.2 billion by the year 2050. Countries with the highest number of child brides include Niger at 76%, which is the highest uh, proportion. But in absolute numbers terms, India has the highest with 26 and a half million child brides. Research from the Women's Refugee Commission uh, say that in Ethiopia, Lebanon and Uganda, child marriage is seen as a way of protecting girls or alleviating hardship caused by conflict. So it appears that we need to add into the picture um, that the current humanitarian crisis and areas of conflicts are working to increase child marriage and indeed forced marriage. The practice, as we've heard, is found to be cultural. Well, whatever it is, whatever it is, it is pervasive discrimination and violence against women and girls. Early marriage forces girls into adulthood and frequently motherhood before they are even emotionally or physically mature themselves. And I have heard young women talk about how they do not feel equipped to look after their babies and they fear that something will happen to their babies because they are not really old and mature enough themselves um, to protect the life that they've just given. So it profoundly affects a girl's life, not only by substantially lowering her educational prospects, but also causing health complications and harm, harming her psychological well-being. So we know that the causality runs both ways. Child marriage reduces educational attainment, and conversely, girls with less access to quality education are much more likely to marry early. In conclusion, presiding officer, in Scotland, we must have a harsh message in our criminal law against all of these crimes. And we must make sure that we have reviewed our law to cover all the aspects of so-called honour-based violence, to include not just the perpetrators, but any family member or anyone who is involved in the uh, premeditated um, murder of any man or woman or girl. Culture can be no excuse for violence and deep-rooted discrimination. But there's so much work to be done, and there's a lot of work to be done internationally, and we should never forget that, towards global progress for all women and for all girl girls. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I call John Finney to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, yesterday, as part of a, a number of small groups in the Justice Committee, uh, indeed with my colleague Mary Fee, we took 
um, evidence from uh, in small groups from an individual explaining a lifetime, uh, this is a, a gentleman in his 50s, a lifetime or a childhood of uh, abuse. The previous session, similarly indeed with yourself uh, uh, chairing the event, uh, took evidence from victims of domestic violence in private and heard the harrowing uh, details they, they had gone through. Likewise, in the previous session, the Equal Opportunities Committee did three evidence sessions, some in private, about the issue of uh, female gen genital mutilation um, and heard very harrowing testimonies from individuals. Oh. Now, I think it's important to say that these took place, obviously, in private with appropriate support and safeguards. And I, I for one, am full of admiration for these individuals and the information and the strength of, they've shown to come forward and, f and inform us as lawmakers and what are complex issues, and there's no, no issue more complex than this. Of course, the answer isn't laws, and it's for that reason that we have the National Action Plan on Prevention and Eradication of FGM. Because clearly it's not an issue for Parliament, as many have said. For that reason, we certainly be supporting the Labour Amendment and see the key role that um, community leaders play. And it's not lost in many of us that uh, these community leaders will be men. And the, the power that's an intrinsic element of this obscene practice is a power that rise with men, and this is gender-based violence. Um, I'm amazed at the ability humans have to abuse each other, and uh, this is very much a, a link to abusive power, as many others have said. A coercive power, too. Um, and the phrase honour-based violence, I have to say I have difficulty, uh, as I think uh, uh, Ms McNeill, the previous speaker, had with that terminology. I, I don't quite get that at all. And similarly, victims of female genital mutilation, to them, that term, the overwhelming majority, that term means nothing. There are many euphemisms that have been used with uh, young girls and young women. They're told they're going to a party, they're going to a holiday. They've been tricked by their family, by community. And that in itself is a huge breach of trust, which has, uh, resonates for, for, for a lifetime. Now, I acknowledge that there are cultural pressures, um, but let's be quite clear how these cultural pressures manifest themselves. They manifest themselves in a child being attacked, sexually assaulted, mutilated, restrained and detained, often for days. And I think the very worrying thing is the psychological effect, which I think is unmeasurable that that has, and a dignity that's been stolen. And I'll not rehearse the various medical issues, but uh, the, the, the reproductive issues, I think, are, again, are significant, and many lifetime medical issues as a consequence of this. The Equal Opportunities, excuse me, legacy paper from the last session uh, talked about, I quote, problems identified could have been avoided if staff had been trained. And again, there are issues that isn't a criticism. There are issues about that. Cultural sensitivities. Um, some women appearing at uh, medical practices accompanied by a male. And the challenges people will understand that there are. But these cultural sensitivities, we have to get on with them. I'm not want a monoculture for Scotland. I think Scotland grows from the, the growing diversity of our culture. And we need to deal with this. So this has nothing to do with an attack on any individual um, culture. It's entirely in line with the United Nations approach which sees the utmost protection afforded to all females and a maximum support for those who seek to end this abhorrent practice. <coughs> it's, excuse me, it's, it's not easy. But I would cite some examples where there have been sizable changes, both in reporting the practice that's followed that and indeed uh, courts. Domestic, uh, domestic violence has seen a wholesale change in approach from police practice to practices in court and the support that's there. Likewise, child abuse and sex assault. And whilst there's a way to go on all of these issues, I think uh, we can see that these things never happen straight away, but progress can be made. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, what's clear is education is vital. And that education, um, again, is challenging communities where um, um, men uh, have often undue sway. Training is very important in raising a, a, a awareness, particularly with health professionals. The BMA, and I'm grateful to them for their, their briefing paper, talk about those that are at risk and the assistance they give to identifying that. Likewise, the education authorities and understanding that people perhaps returning to countries uh, where, where the, the previous generation came from and understanding the, the potential, particularly at, at key, key moments in a, a young girl's life. Um, so I, I commend the professionals who have been involved in this. I commend the volunteers, as many others have, who are unsung. And they're unsung for a very particular reason, many of them. And that is because, regrettably, to be effective, they must remain anonymous. So 
Um, I think it's important we have uh, uh, the, these international days. This is an international issue. We will be supporting the Conservative Party um, uh, amendment and taking a deep breath, I commend the UK Government on their support on this issue. Um, the, uh, the, the reality is that there is an action plan. It is, as others have said, tied into equally safe. This is about equality. This is about gender-based violence. We must have zero tolerance. And as the BMA says, we must break the generational, generational cycle of FGM. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr Finney. Paul Alec Cole-Hamilton, followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Cole-Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I start with a declaration of interest that before I came to this place, I sat on the Ministerial Task Force on Violence Against Women and Girls that was uh, delivering uh, equally safe the strategy uh, on that subject. Um, I rise to offer the full-throated support of these benches uh, to the government's excellent motion and the amendments we have before us tonight. And I welcome the consensual and respectful tone of today's debate. This is a, a subject which clearly unites the Chamber. I always welcome an opportunity uh, to speak in such debates. But the fact that we even have to debate this in 2017 is an indictment of our global strive towards modernity and the empowerment of women. It is uh, a symptom of the mountain that we still have to climb in this regard and in tackling this most gendered of all natures of violence. That three million girls and young women are each year subjected to acts of barbarism and mutilation in the name of culture and tradition is a humanitarian outrage. It is an atrocity of eye-watering proportions. Now, legislators often walk very carefully through the cultures and traditions of other societies. Uh, we, we have to uphold diversity and we have to respect it. But where, it, uh, where there are practices involved in it which are dangerous, abhorrent and cruel, we have to have a willingness to take that head on. And I'm very glad to see colleagues of all parties do so, so eloquently in this debate. And as we have heard many times in this excellent debate, particularly in the words of Ruth Maguire, Claire Hawkey, John Finney just a minute ago, that this may be an act of cultural exception, uh, acceptance or a rite of passage. But it has nothing to do with religion or, uh, or faith. Nowhere in scripture or in sacred, in sacred texts or the words of prophets are atrocities like this laid out as articles of faith or commandment. And some communities have sought to ascribe a causal relationship between the two, but we must be in no doubt, presiding officer, that over the centuries this grotesque practice has been performed. It is driven solely by the sexual jealousy and, and inadequacy of men. The very nature of FTM, an honour-based violence presiding officer, is fundamentally gendered in its nature, but its solution is not. We as parliamentarians of all genders have a duty to call ab out abuse, whether it is the cutting of girls, whether it is the beating of sisters or wives, and say with such resounding unity that such behaviour is criminal, criminal, it is obscene, and it has no place in our society. Together we have made great strides in this agenda and I absolutely commend the Scottish Government on their ambitious national action plan. It has our full support. It is a vital step in our collective response and rightly elevates this to a preeminence of new heights in our national consciousness. It sets out a blueprint for national and local government, the third sector, the police, schools and communities to work together to raise awareness, share best practice on things like reporting. We need to learn from the lived experience of victims. By listening to those who would otherwise struggle to be heard in the first place, we can build interventions around the stories they tell us. I, I would have been helped or kept safe if this had happened or if this intervention uh, had been available. These are the stories we need to hear. Right out of the traps, we need to foster in girls and young women an understanding of their rights enshrined in our culture and in our laws. We need to build awareness of victimhood amongst those who may not even be aware that they are victims and foster then safe spaces for them to disclose what has happened to them. In our society, we have to recognize that there are still uh, frontiers where we have to answer the, the needs of equality uh, for women and look at um, attitudes in our boardrooms over maternity rights and equal pay. All of these are areas of kind of commonplace discrimination which add to a wider narrative that is still ages old and which ultimately, if unchecked, feed the very worst aspects of the barbarism and cruelty we're discussing this afternoon. Now, I am heartily glad that this action plan 
is so grounded in a rights-based approach, rooting policy both in prevention and in awareness raising firmly in Article 24 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which calls for the prohibition of all traditional practices that are prejudicial to he the health and the well-being of women. And now John Finney said that we don't need laws for this. And I, I, I would take issue with that because I have stated many times in this place and outside that it is my belief that we shall only make rights real with the full incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scots law. Only then will children have access to justice and redress when rights of any kind are violated. And in turn, this has a societal effect of making rights real because when systemically we're forced to consider implications for children's rights, we naturally foster a rights-based approach to public policy. And only by so... I will take from John, John Finney. Finney. Thank you, Mr. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. If that's how it came over, that's not, I, I mean, it's not exclusive. We can pass all the laws we want. It's going to be more than that. It's going to be about education primarily. Mr. Cole Hamilton. I thank John Finney for the intervention. I often also recognise his contribution and our shared goals in this area, and I welcome that intervention. Uh, but only by incorporating will we actually see a rights-based approach to public policy. And only by so doing can we ensure that we protect our women and girls within... Our, sorry, protect women and girls within our shores and by extension offer an example to the world of how rights matter. Our silent indignation on this matter is a futility that we can no longer afford or indulge. Uh, we need to protect and empower to bring justice to the guilty and to the complicit. Coretta Scott King said that struggle is a never-ending process, that freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it with every generation. But in this bloody tradition, no generation has really ever seen freedom or satisfaction prevail. I think it's time that we let ours be the first. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. Paul Tom Arthur to be followed by Miles Briggs. Mr. Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful to have the opportunity to participate in this afternoon's debate ahead of International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation on the 6th of February. I welcome this motion by the government and the opportunity to discuss the national, national Action Plan to prevent and eradicate FGM, both of which in their tone and detail show the correct approach to what is a challenging and complex issue. Presiding officer, I, I think it's only fair to acknowledge and, and welcome the amendments, um, particularly in the name of Annie Wells, and I'm sure Alex Cole Hamilton will join me in this, in a, indirectly recognising the work of Lynn, now Baroness Featherstone, who is Parliamentary Undersecretary for International Development announced the funding referred to by Ms Wells his motion um, in, at the UN Commission for the Status of Women in March 2013. Um, that one thing I'll maybe highlight is that this programme is set to end next year and I, I hope um, uh, Annie Wells will urge her colleague um, Priti Patel, the UK Secretary of State for International Development, to build upon this existing work and also to continue to encourage our um, colleagues to continue to work with and to support um, Ailey Whiteford's private members bill calling for the UK government to ratify the Istanbul Convention. I think it's also only fair to acknowledge uh, an amendment in the name of Mary Fee which highlights the need outlined in the National Action Plan um, for working with communities to break the cycle of violence. And I'd also just like to acknowledge um, many of the other speakers in this debate, Alec Cole Hamilton, Claire Hockey in particular, um, for their excellent contributions and the overall tenor um, of this debate as well. Presiding officer, the government's motion acknowledges that a preventative approach, uh, a preventative, supportive and legislative approach is crucial to tackling, preventing and eradicating FGM. And I think on all of these, uh, three of these aspects, we are making progress. In terms of legislation, it was only in 1985, the year that I was born, that FGM was made illegal in Scotland through the Prohibition of Female Circumcision Act. While the date of that legislation is relatively recent, it is indicative of the progress made that the term female circumcision is rightfully no longer in common use and is probably far less known nowadays than the term FGM. This is reflected in the more recent 2005 Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation Scotland Act and the further strengthening of legislation that of course has since occurred as well with the uh, Serious Crime Act in 2015. And I'd also want to highlight that legislative progress has also been made in tackling forced marriage, which, like FGM, can be associated with honour-based violence. The Forced Marriage um, Protection and Jurisdiction Scotland Act 2011 provides a specific civil remedy for those threatened with forced marriage and those already in such a marriage. 
and enforced marriage in Scotland was recently criminalised in section 122 of the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act 2014. Crucially, that act states that a person committing an offence is committing an offence if he or she uses violence, threats or any other form of coercion for the purpose of causing another person to enter into a marriage and be believe or ought reasonably to believe that their conduct may cause other person to enter into the marriage without free and full consent. I highlight this because the terms used in that act are important because they recognise the various and complex ways in which people can be pressured into forced marriages. Presiding officer, it's clear that we have made progress in legislation on both forced marriage and FGM, and I'm encouraged by the work already underway or imminent as set out in the National Action Plan which constitutes the preventative and supportive aspects of the approach to tackling FGM. Measures undertaken by the Scottish Government include issuing communications to police, education bodies and the NHS. Also, in 2014, the National Guideline, Guidance for Child Protection was updated to include a specific section providing advice on how to respond if there are concerns that a child may have been subject to or may be at risk from FGM. And, of course, there is now a standing oper operating procedure in place with Police Scotland. Presiding officer, FGM is perhaps the most overt manifestation of the patriarchy's attempts to dominate, control and possess women. And while FGM has not been historically a traditional cultural practice in Scotland, the fundamentally chauvinistic and misogynistic attitudes that underpin it, FGM and honours-based violence, do evince themselves in domestic abuse, rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, stalking and commercial sexual exploitation. Those attitudes also evince themselves through sexual discrimination in the workplace and in the gender pay gap, as well as in the societal pressures and expectations that are placed upon girls and women regarding their bodies, their appearance and their role in society. While government, parliament, community leaders and partner organisations all have an important role to play, sustained progress will only be achieved when individual men address and abandon their own paleolithic attitudes. Writing in the mid-19th century, William Thompson said, as your bondage has chained down man to ignorance and vices of despotism, so will your liberation reward him with knowledge, with freedom and happiness. Presiding officer, liberty, knowledge, freedom and happiness are the rights of all human beings. Gender inequality denies those rights to one half of the population and gives the other the illusion of it. We all have a duty to work towards a society where we can all enjoy the same rights and opportunities. Achieving this will not be easy. Max Weber remarked that politics is a strong and slow boring of hard boards. It takes both passion and perspective. But he went on to say that we would not have attained the possible unless time and again we had reached out for the impossible. Eradicating FGM will, as made clear in the National Action Plan, be challenging and complex. But it is a challenge that I have every confidence that this government, this parliament and this country will rise to. In doing so, we will have taken another, another step towards creating a truly equal society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr. Gibson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And like others, I welcome today's debate. Um, and the significant degree of consensus which has been demonstrated around the chamber today and maybe that really goes to emphasize the importance of this issue i'd also like to congratulate the cabinet secretary for the work she's undertaken specifically in this area i think it's crucial that we unite as a parliament to send out a message that we will not tolerate fgm and honor-based violence in scotland these are crimes which must be tackled using provisions available and as has already been mentioned today in the debate, it's of real concern that today there have been yet no successful prosecutions for FGM. I think today's debate has also demonstrated that this is a subject where the Scottish and UK governments must work closely together if we are to make progress towards eradicating FGM. I want to put on record my strong support for Prime Minister Theresa May and the significant work she undertook personally on FGM and indeed on forced marriages during her time as Home Secretary. In addition to criminalising forced marriage, she strengthened laws on FGM, including the mandatory reporting duty, which means health and social care professionals have a legal duty to report known cases of FGM in under 18-year-olds to the police. She also set up innovative national FGM prevention programmes, issued new guidance to raise awareness of FGM amongst police officers, as well as instructing Her Majesty's Inspectorate 
of constabularies to carry out an inspection of police and their response to honour-based violence from a, with a real focus on FGM and forced marriage. And I welcome the positive engagement an ongoing partnership approach which Scotland's national plan to prevent and eradicate FGM is achieving, as well as the equally safe strategy. I hope the Scottish Government will continually assess the effectiveness of the work being undertaken across the UK and in other governments across the world, both in terms of legislation and the prevention and the consideration of what more can be done um, to support people in Scotland. The former Foreign Secretary, William Haig, also undertook a great deal of excellent work on this um, specific issue, trying to tackle FGM abroad, and we should remember the efforts um, he undertook in this area. Now, my colleague Annie Wells is right to note the continuing international development and support from the UK Government in her amendment. The Prime Minister has said in relation to FGM that legislation alone is not enough. We must do more to prevent these harmful practices ever happening in the first place. We must raise awareness, challenge social norms, and protect those at risk, and I agree. Sometimes this will mean ensuring political or cultural sensitivities are not used as an excuse to prevent the, and uncover abuse. And while this might be challenging, we must make it clear that there can be no soft touch approach and the laws of this country apply to everyone living here in every section of our society. And I agree with the Scottish Government's motion on this, that communities and individuals affected must be at the heart of work done on FGM and on a based violence. Increasingly, the concern is that FGM is being undertaken on young women outside of the UK. In many cases, girls and young women are taken to countries under the pretense that they may be going on holiday or to visit family members in other countries. Ahead of today's debate, I watched again the excellent documentary the Cut, which was made in 2009 by campaigner, filmmaker and writer Linda May Callistein. And she helped spread worldwide awareness of this issue around FGM. And it's worth reflecting, as has already been said, the actual scale of this issue internationally when you consider that FGM affects around 200 million women across our world. Traditions are very strong in many cultures. Sadly, the cultural myths behind this 5,000-year-old African tradition have not been addressed by religious community and official leaders in many countries around the world, and we all have the responsibility to try to address that. I think today's debate has very much demonstrated the need also to focus work and resources towards at-risk individuals and communities to help educate community leaders on the long-lasting damage, as well as the ongoing emotional distress FGM can cause. And I want to commend the work of local organisations in my region, such as um, Shakti Women's Aid and Scottish Women's Aid, Women's Aid um, which have really important um, work to do and have a real important role to play in this area. Shakti Women's Aid is an important source of information and advice for women from ethnic minority communities across Lothian and offers a safe refuge um, for those at risk. And I'd encourage any constituent who fears they may be at risk of facing FGM or know someone, including young girls, to contact um, Scottish Women's Aid to seek support in total confidence. It's important that all elected representatives raise awareness of the support services that exist and help to get this message out to the ethnic minority communities which we represent across our regions and constituencies. To conclude, presiding officer, this is, important. this is an important debate and the Scottish Conservatives will happily work with the Scottish Government and parties across this chamber to help achieve the societal, cultural and attitudinal changes that we need in order for FGM and honour-based violence to be eliminated in Scotland. In doing so, we urge ministers to work closely with the UK Government and community organisations at all levels to ensure that the legal and criminal justice systems are appropriately supported to punish and deter the perpetrators of these abhorrent practices. And I wanted to close by repeating the words of Linda May Callistine. The topic is not pretty. We're talking about long-term suffering and death. Despite the disgust we feel at at the very thought of it, we should not look away. Young girls who are unable to defend themselves are the victims. They suffer in silence. We can help them by giving them a voice and make this world, make this voice heard across the world. Support the victims even more by demanding that female genital mutilation must stop. Unlike many problems facing our world, 
there is a lack of resources in much of the world and much needs to be done. But here the answer lays very simply in a solution of not doing something anymore. FGM simply needs to stop. And I give my support to those words and to the amendment in my colleague Annie Wells's name. Thank you very much, Mr Briggs. Um, I, before I move to the last speaker, um, can I just say to Ms Lynn, I think you know you've got extra time, up to eight minutes. Can I say to Oliver Mundell, you've got up to nine minutes to close. So you get a little bit of extra time. I now call Kenneth Gibson, who's the last speaker in the open debate, before we move to closing speeches. And you know where that takes you if you're not in and you've been in the debate. So, fair warning to MD to have a cup of tea in their hand. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too welcome this uh, debate, giving valuable time in the Chamber to an issue that so many of us have long been deeply concerned about. It is 16 years since I submitted a motion on so-called honour-based violence in support of United Nations Resolution 5556, and more than 15 years since I first lodged a motion condemning female genital mutilation. And as both shocking and distressing, all these years later, this is still an issue faced by countless women and young girls across the globe. In my 2001 motion, I said the FGM is a, a violation of the human rights of girls and women as it represents an attempt to control women's sexuality and subordinate their status in society. This point stands as strongly as ever today, and it's something we, we must bear in mind as we move forward to eradicate FGM. In a further motion I set to Parliament in 2012 regarding International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, I said that society is left all the more impoverished when it allows violence in any form to hinder any girl or woman from realising her full potential. Some five years later, this is a message that I'm sure resonates deeply with all of us here in the Chamber. And FGM, without a doubt, is a form of violence that hugely threatens so many women's lives. It is thought, as we have heard from many contributors, that some 200 million women worldwide have been impacted by FGM at some point in their lives. And every single year, uh, yet another 3 million girls become at risk of this appalling procedure. These numbers are so staggering that they are hard to comprehend. The sheer cruelty of FGM, can, combined with these figures, can make this an issue which is extremely difficult to come to terms with. But it is vital that we do not shy away from this important issue. It's only by facing it that we can take action and move towards a safer and fairer place for women and girls all over the world. Perhaps one of the most shocking aspects of the issues is that uh, it could occur here in the United Kingdom with suggestions that the most common age for a girl to go through this horrifying process is between seven and nine years old. Girls forced through this dangerous and traumatising process, um, wherever it occurs, are then left to deal with lifelong consequences. Of course, there are many immediate dangers with mutilation, such as hemorrhage and infection, particularly when the process is done in unsafe and unsterile conditions, often without even anaesthesia for the young girls going through this. However, in the long term, there are many health risks and problems that these girls will go on to face for the rest of their lives uh, in terms of their uh, mental health. And I'm particularly concerned about the lack of research and information available about the psychological and psychosexual impact FGM can have. Uh, it seems obvious that there are many long-term psychological consequences due to this childhood trauma. As FGM is most likely inflicted by close family members of these young girls, issues of trust and confidence in their family is likely to be something uh, they will have to deal with them for the less of their lives. How can you trust anyone, no matter how close, who's inflicted such uh, appalling violence upon you? Mental health issues, including psychosis, anxiety and depression, have, uh, have been uh, widespreadly reported. And there is much to be done uh, to provide for women who have been through the trauma of FGM. Um, we, understand that, uh, um, we need to understand it as best we can in order to offer uh, young girls the support they so very much need, and indeed women, as they grow older because I don't think this is something which will ever go away for those who've suffered it. It cannot go away, and I'm not talking physically, I'm talking psychologically. Well, there is some uh, long way to go over the last 15 years. Key steps have been taken, both here in Scotland and further afield across the world, to improve the lives of women who suffered this torture and to prevent it from happening in others. Here in Scotland, the FGM has been unlawful since 1985, and further legislation over the years has continued to improve our society's approach to this matter. And this was particularly strengthened in the Serious Crime Act 2015. And the Scottish Government have worked to improve the lives of potential victims since my first motion way back in 2001. 
I am proud to be of a country that is taking progressive and important steps towards eradicating gender-based violence. And in June of last year, the Scottish Government announced £20.3 million of funding to tackle discrimination across, across Scotland. This was divided uh, between 224 projects across a variety of groups in order to help families, communities and individuals address discrimination and inequality. Specifically, in my own constituency, this included North Ayrshire's Women's Aid, uh, based in Solcoats, which carries out invaluable work to help protect and support women who are vulnerable, uh, and, in, and it may include uh, women who have suffered the atrocities of FGM. For many women who have suffered from this horrific torture, uh, there may be feelings of shame or fear to speak out about the terror they have been through. Often these women face intense pressure from within the cultural group. There are many factors that can hold women back from speaking out and looking for the support they so desperately need. They often fear uh, that the stigma could be attached to them if such an issue is raised and so suffer in silence for much or even perhaps their entire lives. Presiding officer, it's therefore imperative that for the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Gen Genital Mutilation, we take this opportunity to make clear to all those of every age and background that have been through such horrific torture that they can find a safe place here in Scotland. We are a country of inclusivity and acceptance. It is vital that we continue to do everything possible, both here in the Chamber and as a nation, to work towards an even safer place for women to come forward and live their lives in peace and safety. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. Before I move to closing speeches, I note that uh, uh, Gordon Lindhurst is not present for summing up and closing speeches. I'm tired of saying this. Can I say that presiding officers are taking a note of offenders and we have ways of dealing with them. You might just find out you're not going to get to speak in a debate. We have that within our power. So somebody will convey that to Mr Lindhurst. Perhaps somebody should have warned him in advance that this will happen because we are absolutely furious at this continuing to happen. It's a disrespect to colleagues, a disrespect to Parliament and certainly a disrespect to the Chair and it's not going to continue. After that, and I'm smiling at you, Miss Lennon, would you like to close for Labour, please? Up to eight minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I want to begin by joining with colleagues from right across the Chamber in welcoming the opportunity to recognise the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation and to reiterate Scottish Labour's full support for the Scottish Government's motion and indeed the National Action Plan and to put on record my um, recognition of the Cabinet Secretary's strong leadership in this area. And it is important that we have women in our parliament, but it's equally important that we have feminists in our parliament. And I think from right across the chamber, male and female, we have certainly seen that in action today. Female genital mutilation is unquestionably a, comp a complete violation of the rights of women and girls across the world. As the Cabinet Secretary said in her opening remarks, it has no place in society. And as Ruth Maguire touched on, it's the most extreme act on a spectrum of gender-based violence. And Ruth Maguire also said it's easy to condemn uh, FGM, but it is less easy to eradicate. But I think we all take the point that we all have a responsibility to call out whether we see it as low-level sexism and misogyny, and I think we were all horrified about the way Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh was treated in the House of Commons when she was barked at. And that um, humiliation towards women, when they are in places of power and have a position and have a voice, we have to call that out. And I'm glad that people across the, p the political spectrum did so. We've heard today that female genital mutilation has no health benefits to women and girls and the briefing that we've had from the BMA uh, is, is very important and it says that there should be no uh, acceptance of medicalisation of it, there isn't any mild form of FGM, it is barbaric and it is mutilation. I think Claire Hawkey touched on some of the, the real physical trauma and also the, the psychological trauma that is involved. Um, you know, we're talking about little girls in Scotland, the age group most at risk are, are children aged between seven and nine, when the summer holidays uh, can be the, the, the point where their, their childhood is robbed forever. And Annie Wells also touched on that, that psychological uh, aspect too in, in her opening remarks. There is absolutely no place for this in our society, but the the difficult part about this is that we don't really know the extent of it because it is such a hidden 
a secret practice. One of the things that's, that's really struck me from today is, is the fact that, that we know that, that the girls uh, are not just victims at the point that this barbaric practice is carried out, it's the cycle that continues, and indeed we've, we've touched on that today, about uh, survivors then becoming the perpetrators themselves. A book that I was reading over the Christmas recess, The War on Women, by the late Sue Lloyd Roberts, the first chapter is uh, The Cruelest Cuts, and it's absolutely relevant to what we are discussing today. And it's, it's so disturbing, um, but I just wanted to touch on one of the, the experiences as a, as a mother in the Gambia, and she's been involved in, in holding down her daughter uh, when FGM is being carried out on her. But th this mum is uh, about to become the cutter in the village due to another family member uh, um, moving on from that, that role. And she talks about, can you imagine holding down your five-year-old daughter and they are cutting her and she is screaming and calling out mum. And mum is the one holding down your legs and there is nothing mum can do. I was shaking my head and tears were coming to my eyes and I said to my mind that whatever happens I will never do this, I will never do the cutting but I keep it to myself. This is when I regretted having a doctor. I mean it's just so tragic and others have talked about uh, honour-based violence, honour-based killings. I think putting these words together today has been difficult for people to get to get that out because um, if ever there was an oxymoron I think that is it. It's very overwhelming because we've talked about how complex this is and how difficult it is and we can't just solve it by legislation alone it needs cultural change so I think that's why the, the national uh, action plan is so important. But International Day of Zero to Tolerance for FGM it is an opportunity for Scotland to highlight the actions that we can take to make sure we all do what we can to ensure children in this country are protected from a practice that experts tell us will cause them to suffer serious and long-term physical and mental health problems. I'm very grateful uh, to the support across the chamber for the amendment in Mary Fee's name because I think we do recognise that it's not a problem that women can solve alone. We need men in communities, we need leaders in communities to take that responsibility. Uh, and I'm very proud today that across the chamber we are united and we recognise that we do have to work together. Um, as I said at the very beginning, we do welcome the work by the Scottish Government on this issue and the action plan. And we also uh, commend Annie Mills, for her, Annie Mills for her amendment because we do recognise the, the contribution the UK Government has made in trying to combat this problem internationally. It is an issue that absolutely requires cross-party and indeed international cooperation. There's been so many uh, fantastic contributions from colleagues today. Um, I don't want to uh, sort of miss anyone out. Um, I think uh, John Finney was very powerful when he said that this is about power, power that lies with men. Uh, and again, touching on the, the importance of community leaders. And I think it is important that we've had so many men speaking in the debate today. Um, Kenneth Gibson has... Um, and enlightened me because I, I wasn't aware uh, of Kenneth Gibson's previous uh, motions and it is uh, quite scary to think that these motions date back to 16 years ago but that tells us that this is something that our Scottish Parliament has been uh, advocating now for a very long time but it is important that we don't give up and we, we keep going on, on these issues. I um, realise I've been given a bit extra time, but I think in terms of, of, of closing up, we, we realise that it is very important to, to bring people to, to justice for this. You know, we do understand that, that prevention is absolutely something that we're all committed to, but it would send a very strong message if we were able to bring forward prosecutions because people do deserve to be punished for the, the abuse that's been carried out to, uh, to the most vulnerable people in our society. Uh, so again, I would like to thank all colleagues who have made contributions today. 
Um, this is not something that's going to go away and you know, perhaps in another 16 years time someone will be bringing forward a motion. But I think it's in days like today when this parliament unites to say not in our name, whether it's in Scotland, in the rest of the UK or anywhere in the world, this is barbaric, it's an absolute violation of human rights and the Scottish Parliament will not stand for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul Oliver Mundell to close to the Conservatives. Up to nine minutes, please, Mr Mundell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to close uh, this debate for the Scottish Conservatives today. And I think we can all agree it's been an extremely moving and powerful debate with very strong uh, contributions from right across uh, the chamber. Uh, I'm particularly uh, grateful uh, to Mary Fee for uh, her contribution. I think uh, she and Monica Lennon are both absolutely right in emphasising the importance uh, of avoiding uh, some kind of situation uh, where we could medicalise uh, FGM. Uh, and I think that would be uh, truly uh, unacceptable and uh, a retrograde uh, step, as uh, the BMA themselves have said uh, in their briefing uh, for today's debate. Uh, I also think uh, that uh, Ruth Maguire was uh, right to uh, re-emphasise uh, the importance uh, of community-based solutions, and that's uh, something uh, I will uh, talk further on uh, in my own contribution. Uh, I was also uh, pleased with uh, Gordon Lyndhurst's attempts to uh, draw us uh, again to the, the, the harsh reality that uh, lots of these issues are not new, uh, but uh, I, I was left uh, taking some hope uh, out of his remarks, because I think when we look uh, back at our history, we have made uh, significant strides forward uh, when it comes uh, to the rights of women here in Scotland. And whilst that job is far from uh, complete, I do think it is important to recognise that with a combined effort, uh, real progress uh, can be made. And that, that takes me uh, neatly on to uh, Tom Arthur's uh, contribution. I think we're getting used to uh, his uh, powerful uh, trademark uh, style, uh, but I think he's right to bring together some of the other issues around gender inequality uh, and recognising that uh, female uh, genital mutilation can't be just tackled in isolation and that across our society uh, where we make sure that in every aspect of their life uh, that uh, women's rights are, uh, are fully fulfilled, it does empower people uh, to, to take forward and challenge uh, the abuse that they've been uh, subjected to. And I also, uh, on that note, welcome uh, Kenneth Gibson's uh, long-standing commitment to this issue, which, uh, like others, uh, I've only become aware of uh, during today's debate. I was also very interested uh, to, to hear the focus uh, he placed on some of the mental health uh, and psychological aspects of this crime, uh, because, again, I think it can be very easy uh, from, from, from looking at it on a, uh, quite, you know, on, on a, quite a, a, a sort of um, brief uh, basis to somehow think that this is purely uh, about physical harm uh, and it's very clear uh, that that's not the case. Um, I thought that uh, Miles Briggs, uh, my uh, colleague, was, was also right to highlight uh, the importance of having uh, the correct support services in place, particularly uh, when it does come to challenging the lifelong uh, harm uh, that FGM uh, causes. And uh, in uh, her remarks, I think Monica Lennon was also right, again, to emphasise the importance of securing prosecution. And I think across the whole of the United Kingdom, if we could see just one person uh, brought to justice for this crime, uh, then we'd see an awful lot more people uh, come forward. And I think that would have a uh, tremendous uh, symbolic importance. Um, I think that the, all those uh, contributions and the motion itself uh, and the amendments before us today uh, do go a long way to send out a strong and unified message that female genital mutilation is abhorrent, unacceptable and has no place in our society ahead of the International Day of Zero Tolerance on the 6th of February. That said, I, I've got to uh, be honest enough to admit that as a 27-year-old uh, male preparing for this debate and researching some of the issues around the topic, I've not found it easy uh, either to fully come to terms 
uh, with the horror uh, these practices instill in victims and survivors, but also in understanding the cultural practices surrounding uh, female genital mutilation. And I think that's the real challenge, uh, which we can't afford to lose sight of. Just because something is alien to us, because it's not a problem uh, that we've encountered firsthand, does not mean that it's forgivable to stand by and watch uh, while these practices continue. Not only in countries abroad, but here in Scotland, in shadowy places behind closed doors, uh, victims are left isolated and do not feel uh, they can come forward. And I think we've got to uh, be willing to stand up, as many colleagues have pointed out, to uh, the cultural uh, challenges and not be afraid uh, to, to, to stand up uh, and, 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 and call out uh, breaches of human rights, no matter uh, how sensitive we can sometimes feel uh, to the beliefs of others, there are some things that are uh, just wrong. Uh, but saying that, uh, I, I agree uh, with uh, John Finney and some other members that law alone uh, is, is not enough. And that's why we on these benches do welcome uh, the efforts and the support uh, the, the Scottish Government have been putting together of drawing together the National Action Plan and focusing on a multifaceted and interagency response that brings together all aspects of public life. Not only that, I think that the motion recognises in order to truly prevent and eradicate female genital mutilation, we do need to look to communities and individuals who are directly affected in order to break down the barriers, change attitudes over the longer term and ensure that people are willing to talk about what is a very difficult, intimate and deeply disturbing and upsetting subject. But in doing that, we can't leave it to those communities alone. And I do welcome, uh, as many members have done very graciously across the chamber, uh, the efforts uh, of the UK government internationally uh, on all our behalf uh, to try and tackle some of those cultural issues uh, at the root, uh, rather than uh, waiting uh, till events have taken place. And I think uh, we all need to reflect uh, on that and look to see what more we can do to promote education and change people's minds. But in closing, I feel we've heard many statistics, uh, many examples of where this practice is ongoing and some of the legal challenges we face. But I don't feel I'd be doing this subject justice if uh, I didn't outline some of the testimony of those who've been personally affected. In preparation for today, I was truly moved by the words of a Somali girl who actually wanted to be cut. She said, and I quote, I had absolutely no idea that this was wrong. I thought it was completely normal. It was a rite of passage, like something wonderful was about to happen to you. From a young age, you were told that girls who weren't cut were promiscuous. If you weren't cut, you were isolated. No child wants to be that girl who nobody wants to play with because they're dirty and unclean. It was a big deal, something that I really wanted to happen to me. That in itself tells you how difficult an area this is and just what a challenge we have ahead of us if we're going to see female genital mutilation eradicated. And we have a plan of action now. Uh, the challenge is going to be delivering on it. And I think that there is the willingness across this chamber uh, to take the issue on, but it can't just be a debate uh, that we have here and then uh, forget about or place to one side. Uh, we, we really need to uh, keep a continual focus on the National Action Plan and make sure uh, that it delivers and it meets the changing challenges. So, presiding of, Deputy Presiding Officer, we on this side of the Chamber fully support the Scottish Government in its efforts uh, on this subject and recognise the need to do more, both here in Scotland and globally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mundell. I now call Angela Constance to close for the Governor. Cabinet Secretary, 459, please, or thereabouts. Thank you very much, President Officer, and thank you to everyone who has contributed uh, to this debate this afternoon. As Alec Cole Hamilton says, this has been a consensual and respectful debate, and there's been a recognition uh, across the political divide that on this matter there is a real collective endeavour required. 
I want also to thank Monica Lennon for her solidarity with her colleague and friend, Tasmina Ahmed Al Sheikh. Uh, that is uh, much appreciated. And it is always encouraging uh, to hear the commitment that exists across the chamber um, to tackle uh, female genital mutilation and so called honour based violence and supporting survivors uh, of these practices both at home and abroad. Uh, and John Swinney uh, rightly said it is important that we debate uh, international issues uh, in this place. I enjoyed very much uh, listening to Oliver Mundell's uh, summation. He gave a, a refreshingly uh, honest um, account uh, of his own reflections uh, and how we all at a personal level uh, need to uh, contemplate change. And it's the change uh, that we make as individuals that leads to bigger uh, political uh, organisational uh, change. And he is absolutely right. It is now about how we turn debate uh, into delivery, uh, how we turn words uh, into deeds. And my own uh, personal reflection, presiding officer, uh, over and above the fact I'm quite shocked I'm 19 years older than Mr. Mundell, I do get the very strong feeling, having listened to Mr. Mundell on a number of occasions uh, now in this chamber, that there is a feminist in him that is just bursting uh, to get out. <laughs> Annie Wells uh, started uh, today's debate um, again with uh, some very personal uh, reflections and spoke very uh, eloquently about the impact of FGM on the health uh, mentally and physically uh, on women and the lifelong scars, the lifelong uh, consequences uh, of uh, such uh, barbaric action. And she spoke about the difficulties and the challenges uh, associated uh, with this form of violence in terms of it being behind closed doors. But I do want to reassure Annie Wells, also uh, Gordon Lindhurst uh, and uh, Miles Briggs, who I suppose raised some concerns about how there can't be a soft touch uh, approach uh, in Scotland. And where we are uh, right now, we are looking very, very closely uh, at the uh, English and Welsh legislation, the, the Serious uh, Crime Act. There were six provisions in that Act. One of those provisions uh, has already uh, been implemented subject to the, the LCM that I, I mentioned in my opening remarks. Uh, most of the provisions, uh, in principle, you could quite quickly uh, come to an agreement and see how they could have a, an impact in Scotland. Um, I want to be direct and honest with you, there is one or two provisions uh, in the Serious Crime Act that we need to look at uh, very, very closely and in a very detailed manner. And one of those is around the, the mandatory reporting requirement on doctors uh, and, and, and nurses. So what we are doing is we're looking, uh, listening and learning from the experience in England and Wales because there has been some uh, controversy and some difficulties in and around data um, and a bit of a pushback in terms of mandatory reporting south of the border. But as I say, we are given all provisions uh, full and serious uh, considerations, but I felt in terms of transparency, uh, it was important to highlight to Parliament that there are one or two provisions you know, that, um, you know, that we're currently struggling with, but that doesn't mean that it won't give, you know, be given full examination uh, and of course you know, Parliament will be given its place. Mary uh, Fee uh, rightly said how we need to shine a light on this violence and cruelty and be absolutely clear about it and call it out uh, for what it is, that this is the abuse and mutilation of children and it's quite simply uh, uh, wrong. And like others, she spoke of the importance of education, uh, not just in terms of women and girls, but also in terms of boys and men, and echoed uh, the comments made by Alex Cole Hamilton and John Finney that how it's really important that so many men uh, also participated uh, in this debate today. Ruth McGuire, as always, was insightful and thoughtful and spoke about the objectification of women at home and abroad and how that wider inequality uh, underpins everyday sexism that creates a culture that is conducive uh, to, to violence. Gordon Lindhurst, uh, since he's been mentioned, presiding officer, so much in dispatches, um, as often did give a very... Not uh, always happily, I think. <laughs>
Well, um, he gave a very uh, unique historical perspective and at one point I did wonder where he was going uh, with his contribution, but he did of course make some very important points in and around modern day slavery uh, and the, the challenge and the issues uh, with human trafficking. And if I can say to, to him and indeed Miles Briggs uh, that we invest over £700,000 in specialist agencies uh, in the third sector, you know, for example, Shakti uh, Women's Aid, who can give that very specialist uh, and trusted uh, support. Claire Hawkey spoke about the cycle of abuse uh, and also about the barriers to reporting uh, and the barriers to seeking assistance and how we need uh, to, to overcome that. And John Swinney and Monica, sorry, John Finney um, and Monica Lennon uh, made a very important point that ran throughout the debate uh, in terms of our discomfort with the phrase uh, honour-based uh, violence. And I note that yesterday the Conservative MP uh, Nusrat Ghani uh, brought forward a private member's bill calling for uh, a new domestic violence bill to stop using the term honour killing. And I quote when she said yesterday that language matters and the use of term honour to describe a violent criminal act sometimes committed against a man but more often against a woman can be explained only as a means of self-justification for the perpetrator. It diminishes the victim and provides a convenient excuse for what in our society should accurately and simply be called out for the murder, rape, the abuse and the enslavement that it is. And I think that, presiding officer, uh, summarises uh, how we all collectively uh, felt today um, in, in chamber. Presiding officer, uh, female genital mutilation, along with other forms of so-called honour-based violence, uh, demonstrates that even in the 21st century, women uh, are deprived of the, their most basic human rights just because uh, of their gender. And our approach to tackling this imbalance of power is grounded in our gendered analysis of violence against women and girls. It is an approach that recognises the complexity and the sensitivity that is required to make a real difference to the lives of women and their girls. And our approach does not just focus upon one area, it recognises the need to, to work in partnership, to protect those at risk and to hold those who perpetrate this abuse uh, to account. And we recognise very much that communities uh, have to be part of the solution and that was a point that was made time and time again during the debate and that our approach places communities firmly at the heart of what we are doing because without engaging communities whether it's men women girls on so-called honour-based violence and empowering those affected to make their own choices while staying safe uh, we will not get anywhere and it is only by uh, learning from experts and by ensuring that what we do is informed by the, the best level of community engagement that we can hope to achieve uh, our objective of seeing a Scotland where FGM, forced marriage and all forms uh, of honour-based violence uh, have indeed uh, been consigned to history. And, presiding officer, we do not underestimate how difficult it is for someone from a practising community to come forward. Uh, if it was easy, more people would indeed be coming forward, and there may already have been prosecutions. However, as we know, looking at this complex issue through a narrow lens can obscure the bigger picture which is preventing this from happening. And this makes our work to raise awareness among communities to bring about attitudinal change to encourage reporting of FGM by women, girls and men all the more important. And while there have been no prosecutions in Scotland, let me be absolutely clear that anyone aware of FGM taking place has a legal and a moral duty to report it. There is absolutely never any excuse for violence against women and girls, no matter uh, how it is described. And those at risk will be protected and those who choose to perpetuate these practices will rightly face uh, the consequences uh, for their actions because standing up to FGM and all other forms uh, of violence against women is much more than about numbers. It's actually about the rights, the human rights uh, of women and girls uh, at home and abroad. And we know that we need to work together with each other, but more importantly, we need to work uh, with communities uh, and frontline services. Presiding officer, it is 
uh, important that whatever we do, it has to be the right approach uh, for Scotland. It is uh, my hope that the work that we are taking forward with our partners will help not only to prevent uh, honour-based violence, it will help to inform a response to the damaging consequences uh, where it has occurred. And importantly, it should also help affected communities to resist it and to understand that there is no good reason uh, for women and girls to experience uh, the harm that it brings. And finally, President Officer, I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, once again all of our partners uh, in all sectors who've worked so well in partnership uh, with the government. It is their commitment and their expertise that is absolutely crucial. And by acting together, we can make our contribution to the global aim to end FGM, along with other forms of so-called honour-based violence and all forms of violence against women and girls uh, a reality. And I have absolutely no doubt, presiding officer, that in this parliament, we have a desire uh, to see uh, FGM and violence against uh, women and girls and all its forms uh, consigned uh, to history. And I want to thank everybody that's participated in the debate this afternoon. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes this afternoon's debate. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 3780 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 3780. Moved. Thank you. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. I'll put the question to the Chamber. The question is that we agree motion 3780 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 3778 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable at stage one for the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 3778. Moved. Thank you. And again, no one has asked to speak against the motion. I'll put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion 3778 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motions. Uh, and I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 3779 on the variation of standing orders. And moved. Thank you. That question will be put at decision time to which we now come. The first question of the four is that amendment 3761.1 in the name of Annie Wells, which seeks to amend motion 3761 in the name of Angela Constance on the prevention and eradication of female genital mutilation and all other forms of so-called honour-based violence be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 3761.2 in the name of Mary Fee, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 3761 in the name of Angela Constance, as amended, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion, motion 3779 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the variation of standing orders be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We now come to members' business in the name of Sandra White, and we'll just take a few moments to change seats.